What's going on, everybody? I hope you're as excited to look at this dude as I'm excited to talk to you right now. All right? I got Curtis over here and Ani, and I'll be talking to, to them throughout the message. I'll be talking to you guys. Go ahead and, you know, throw it in the comments what you're going to say. Shout me out. Hey, PT, preach white boy, whatever, because later I'm going to go check it out, all right? I love you guys. Listen, I'm just honored to be able to be here with you this morning and share what's on my heart. Um, one of the things that I, I heard this morning was, God, I, I went to the scripture in John, and in, in uh, John chapter 20, uh, uh, 12, I'm sorry, in verse 20, it says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. And they said, Sir, they asked, we would like to see Jesus. My goal today is to show you Jesus. Can I get an Amen. <laughs> Well, listen, in this, I hope you guys made it through this, this storm. How many are, went out there um, yesterday or um, today and they did some shoveling or snow plowing or, you know, used a snow blower, right, Matt? Um, it, it, it's looking a lot like Christmas season, isn't it? Um, and I'm thinking, during Christmas, I'm thinking of, you know, the greatest gift of all time, and that's the gift of Jesus Christ. But I'm also thinking about those gifts that we're going to be celebrating around the tree with our family and we're going to be giving out gifts. Now, my question to you is how many people on live or in this room have received a gift before and they had no idea what it was, right? For like me, sometimes I'll get tools from my in-laws or my dad, like a hammer and, and, and drill bits and stuff like that. And I'm not a handyman by any means. And I'm like, dude, what do I do with this? Or how about this? How about parents, Curtis, Ani? How about this? How many parents have received, uh, you know, maybe for your birthday or Christmas time, a drawing from your kids. <laughs> Tell me not, you guys are already laughing. You open that thing, and in one of my comments, you know, before, oh, honey, look at the mace, that looks great. And they say, no, daddy, that's us taking a walk with the dogs. <laughs> oh, it sure is, you know what I mean? So sometimes I wonder, when we think of the embrace of Jesus Christ, when we think of the gift of God in Jesus, I wonder, do we sometimes get it confused? Are we misled? Do we look at Jesus through a, through a broken filter of what he really looks like and what the true gift actually is? So I want to talk about that today. This message is shaped around that idea. Um, but I would love to start by asking you, in this different season of COVID, politics, homeschooling, isolation, job security, how, and take out your journal for me, because I want this message to really make a difference in your life. I don't want to just speak these words, move about our day. I want it to make an impact in your life. Take out your journal, and I want to ask you, how is your heart in this season? How is your heart? Because scripture tells us to guard our heart more than anything else, because the source of your life flows from it. That's in Proverbs 4.23. And I believe that what is in our hearts will directly influence how we act, number one, how we react, and how we ultimately behave. Isn't that good? Have you felt tired? Have you felt frustrated? Have you felt the thought, I need to be more in this season. I'm not enough right now. Have you thought, man, what's going on? Am I good enough? Am I good in my marriage? Am I good with my kids? And it was funny, actually, my son's in first grade, and I'm doing the online schooling. Most of you parents know about that. And my son, he's in first grade, and I'm helping him, right? And he tells me, Dad, it's like you skipped first grade and went straight to work. What a dig, huh? I, I was about to give up parenting right then and there. Tell me not, all right? Have you ever thought, you know, I need to be more. I need to do more. Have I given it enough? Is God, does God see me? Is God even pleased with me? And I had a great conversation with one of my good friends uh, over dinner the other night. And one of his things, as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said to me at the dinner table, Hey, Paul, I hope one day when I die and I, and I stand before God, I truly hope that I can make it into heaven. And it really just made me think, and due to that conversation, it made me want to talk about that today. My friend, I want to include you in this information too, he just came out of a season of, what we could call wrongdoing. He has a, uh, uh, an addiction to drugs, and he's currently coming out of that, but his thought process is, am I still accepted by God? There's no way that God could still love me. I'm, I, I've lacked accomplishment for the Lord. What, what do I have to do now to receive his embrace and to be loved by God? What do I have to do now? This, this, is, this is some of the language that he's talking. 
And like I said, from that conversation there led me to what I want to speak here. And one thing I know to be true is that the voice that we, um, we believe in our mind will determine the future that we will experience. Okay? So husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, singles, um, sons, daughters, friends, employees, believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the view of your life? Go ahead and jot some notes down. Or have you ever even considered this thought? Have you ever at, really asked yourself what you really believe about yourself? How do you see yourself? What are those constant lies or thoughts that you continue to let fester in your mind day in and day out? And let me tell you this, the most influential voice in your life is the one in your head, okay? You can't choose which thoughts come, but let me tell you, we could choose what we catch and hold on to. I love Pastor Emmy said this a while back. He said, the birds will fly over our head, but don't let them build a nest in our hair. What are we holding? What kind of thoughts are we holding in our mind? I am, and I had to learn this. I'm speaking from a place of brokenness in my own life that I had to heal and overcome and spend a lot of time with Jesus in this special area. I've lacked accomplishment. I felt God can't love me due to my weaknesses. I said, how can a God so righteous, so holy, so pure love a person so unworthy, so broken, so just so unrighteous? And then I compare myself to others who are doing for the Lord. They look good on the outside. They just look fantastic. I said, I need to be more like them. I need to earn this. I need to deserve this. I need to uh, accomplish more and more and more. And it, it just drove me to depression, if I could be honest with you. There's days that I would lay in my bed all throughout the day as a parent, as a man in ministry, depressed because I had a broken view of what the love of God looked like in my life. And I'm here to talk about that today. I would love to start by reading a passage that I really look into, and it's from a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. We're going to turn to Philippians 3, starting at verse 1 through 11, and this is in the message, and I want to read this to you. I could almost drop the mic or run away from this place after reading this one scripture. Let me share it with you. It says this, whatever happens, dear friends, be glad in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you this, and it is good for you to hear it again and again. Isn't that good? So I'm glad if you're hearing this for the first time, I'm glad I could be the first one to tell you. He says, watch out for those wicked men, dangerous dogs, I call them, who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For it isn't the cutting of our bodies that makes us children of God. It is worshiping him with our spirits. This is the only true circumcision. We Christians glory in what Christ Jesus has done for us and realize that we are helpless to save ourselves. Go ahead and underline that, bold that, do what you got to do to keep that on your heart. It says, yet if anyone ever had a reason to hope that he could save himself, it would be I. Paul was a bad man. He said, it would be I. If others could be saved by what they are, certainly I could. For I went, to, I went through the Jewish initiation ceremony when I was eight days old having been born into a pure-blooded Jewish home that was a branch of the old original Benjamin family. So I was a real Jew, if there ever was one. I love his language. What's more, I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to every Jewish law and custom. And sincere, yes. So much that I greatly persecuted the church. And I tried to obey every Jewish rule and regulation right down to the very point. Very last point. But all these things, but all these things that I once thought very worthwhile, now I've thrown them away. I'm tearing it up, he says. I'm, listen, he's tearing it up. This is my pedigree. I'm, I'm a boss. I got, look at how many podcasts I do, how many books I read, how many, how many times I can preach a good message. Hey, did you not know I gave to the church? Hey, did you not know? He said, I'm tearing it all up and I'm throwing it in the trash. It's garbage. He says, I'm throwing it up. I'm throwing it out in the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. What are you taking credit for today? What are you taking credit for today? So that I could put my trust and hope in Christ alone. So I could put my trust and hope in Christ alone. I'm spitting. I'm spitting right now. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. 
Mm. I put a, I put aside all else counting and worth less than nothing in order that I can have Christ. I wonder if you're you're broken in your relationship with Christ because of your relating to rules and regulations and your pedigree and what you do for God. He says, I, I want to embrace Christ as he embraces me. I want to hug Jesus as he hugs me. I wonder, can you hug Jesus fully? He says, and become one with him, no longer counting on being saved by being good enough. That was me. I, I, I couldn't continue on doing the things in ministry because I never felt good enough to be saved. I questioned my salvation for about two, three years because I didn't know if I was enough. Or obeying God's laws, but by trusting Christ to save me, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Counting on Christ alone. Now I have given up everything else I have found to be the only way to really know Christ and to experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again. And to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. So whatever it takes, I'll be one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. I know that was a lot right there, but praise God, that's a good scripture. And that's what has set me free from all these expectations. But let me tell you, we just read about a man who, uh, by the name of Paul, who he had a lot of accomplishments. And truly, they could beat anybody. This man was elite. He knew the whole Torah in and out. That's the first five books of the Bible. He knew them in and out. He was somebody that every young Jewish man and every old man, would they would want to be Paul. They would want to be Paul. And notice his language. He tells us, He's throwing it all away in the trash, right? It's waste. It's garbage. I don't want it. I'm over it. I'm done. It doesn't define me. The reason I could do this is so that I could embrace Jesus as he embraces me. Now, let me tell you this right here. Write this down. It says, I say it like this. See, we have to be careful not to compare ourselves to something that was never meant to be the standard. Oh, my goodness. Paul is making a case to say one of my biggest hurdles to having a real embrace with Jesus is my accomplishments. It's what I've done. It's what I do. It's what people say makes me important, right? It's what gives me significance and importance. See, this is the thing. Religion makes us proud of what we have done, but the gospel makes us proud of what Jesus has done. Okay? Go ahead and write that down. Hear him now. He said, I had to rid myself of all that so I could hug Jesus and he could hug me and I wouldn't fall prey to trying to relate to God with rules. I don't want that. I want to go all the way with Jesus. You ever been stressed out in your relationship with God? You ever felt like it's all effort and no reward, right? You ever felt like dissatisfied or you're not saved, right? You feel tired? Anybody? You ever feel angry? I'm mad. Come on, there's a lot of Christians right now in this season that I watch your life and you look very, very mad. <laughs> I love you so much, but you look angry, right? You feel exhausted, you know? And if you never have, I just want you to keep this message in your back pocket because there's going to be a day. Mama said there's going to be days like this. I'm telling you. When I think of the embrace of God, I see the specific Bible story unfold in front of my eyes and it's one of my favorites. And it brings me to Luke 15, the prodigal son. I love it. And I'm going to read through the story. I know it's a lot of scripture, but I, the word of God is above anything. The word of God is better than any words that I could say. So let me read it. Then Jesus said, once there was a father with two sons, a younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me? This is equivalent, guys, to saying, I wish you were dead, Dad. Give me what's mine. So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Shortly after, the younger son packed up all his belongings and traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry, for there was a severe famine in the, that land. So he begged the farmer in that country to hire him. The, fire, the farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing to even eat the schlop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated. The son finally realized what he was doing and thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food that they want and plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I want to go back home to my father's house and say to him, and say to him, and I'll say to him, and I'll say to him, I was wrong, father. I have sinned against you. I'll never be worthy to be called your son. Check the son's language. I'll never be worthy to be called your son. 
Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young man sent home, went, uh, set off for home from a long distance. His father saw him coming dressed as a beggar, and great compassion swelled up in a heart for his son who was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms, picture this now, hugged him dearly, and kissed him over and over with tender love. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be your son. Just let me be. And in the middle of, of the son that he's talking, the father totally interrupts him. He's not even listening. And he, and he says, son, you're home now. Turning to his servants, the father said, quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. And bring me the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For this beloved son of mine was once dead, and now he's alive. He was once lost, but now he's found, and everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. At the end of the story, we find a father who is, in no doubt, a picture of God to us, right? The father runs after his wayward son, and he reaches him and clearly and passionately embraces his boy and kisses him. Let me tell you, if you ever wondered what God is like, he's a hugger. He's a kisser. He's a lover. Get that in your head. We will notice in the story, while the father is hugging him, the son is giving it one, one of those funny hugs. Hey, we've been in church a long time. You guys ever hug somebody who, who hugs kind of funny? You know, they come in all awkward, like a side hug. And it's like, nah, I'm a hugger, bro. Like, I love hugging people. Give me a full hug. Let me hold you and tell you I love you. You know what I mean? Some people just don't know how to hug. That's what the son was doing. He's coming into his own father kind of like, can I really hug you? Oh, real awkward, right? Attempting to give an apology speech. But the father never even acknowledges the speech. I think that's incredible. This tells us something of our God, right? The speech was steeped in accomplishment, or better yet, the lack of accomplishment, right? Earned or deserved, or the son, the son used the word, I am no longer worthy, worthy, right? There was a reason in the story that God says, I ignored the speech. See, when we receive the embrace of Jesus and grace, because it is hard to make sense of, it's hard to resolve. As he's hugging us, we want to explain to him either what we have done for him or why he shouldn't hug us because we haven't done enough for him, right? But let me tell you something. God will ignore that. See, we try to barter and bargain for love, but God simply says, free hugs. <laughs> That's good. See, A.W. Tozer said it like this. He said, we please God most not by frantically trying to make ourselves good, but by throwing ourselves into his arms. I thought that was really good. We have to be careful not to make up in our mind that God is only hugging us because we have earned it or we did something to actually deserve his embrace. We often hug him back with one arm trying to explain to him about our strengths or we're thinking it's because on our good days or t like a day like today, I preached a good word. I, I feel worthy enough to receive his love or I gave to church today. I feel worthy. But what happens when you don't have a good day? What happens? So we're hugging him and we're saying, ha, I know God, you're, you're hugging me because you see my strengths. I'm good, ain't I? I did good today. I, 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 I led worship. Uh, I, I led an outreach event. Uh, I served at your church. I, I, and we have these lists of strengths that we're hugging Jesus thinking it's impressive. But that's not why he's hugging you. Or we come in with the other, with other side with a side hug and we say with one arm, we're embarrassed of our lack, Right? We can't fully hug him because there's lack, there's weakness, there's worry. God, you can't truly be hugging me because there's a lot here. I'm no longer worthy. I'm not worthy to be wrapped in your arms. I have some explaining to do. I have an apology speech. I can't fully hug you because the other half of me is broken, and that is exactly where the problem lies. When we receive the embrace of God, we want to explain to him either what we have done or our list of cred credentials as to why he shouldn't hug us. And I found it real interesting that the same man who tells us of all his accomplishments, all his pedigree, all of what he is, he, he, he mentions in scripture something like this. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 for me. The Apostle Paul says, because of the extravagance of those revelations, so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch of my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down when in fact what he did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around all high and mighty 
At first, I didn't think of it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Same guy who just told us of all his accomplishments, all his pedigree, is now telling us on the flip side, he's got something wrong with him. He's got a weakness. Three times I did that, I asked God to take it and remove it. And then he told me, God says, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to ha let it happen. Paul, you were glad to let it happen? He said, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap, and I began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now I take limitations and strive with good cheer. These limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, oppositions, bad breaks, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker that I get, the stronger I become. Let me tell you, God is not hugging you because of your list of accomplishments or not hugging you because of your lack or uh, your lack of accomplishment. I realize in life and through the scripture, God wants to meet you right in the middle of your lack or weakness. When I was broken, when I was hurt, when I had bad thoughts, that's when I, I needed to go to my father the most. See, many of us say, I can't go to my father because of this, but God is saying, I want you to come to me because of that. Does that make sense? He wants you back home after you fail or have fallen. Even while you're broken, busted up, and have pig slop like the sun all over your face looking so very messy. He wants you back home. Just like my friend, he said, what do I have to do? He wants you back home. He wants you back in his presence. See, while the religious people of our day, they, they try not to look messy in any situation. Remember, Jesus let a prostitute wipe his feet with her hair and his tears, and her tears. I think that's so amazing. See, the goal is to honor God. It's not, it's not to look good in front of all people. It's to honor God. See, and I see that Jesus was never really, he never really had a problem with people who, who were honest and they knew about their shortcomings. He didn't tolerate people who faked it. And that's the truth. Let me ask you this. Was anyone more disqualified than the prodigal son to return to his father? I don't think so. If he received such a welcome, be assured God waits for you full of love and mercy. God has not seen you like the boy was seeing himself. See, the boy was embarrassed by his last job. That's all he could focus on. He was embarrassed at where his weakness led him. But the father thinks to himself, because of those pigs, because of that brokenness, that's the reason you came back home. Those pigs you were eating with, that pig slop at rock bottom brought you back here. It brought you back home. Some of my greatest downfalls, let me be honest, and weaknesses led me to my greatest repentance and worship. I'm being completely honest. That when I have a weakness, I, don't, I worship more than I have ever before. When I have been broken and I've failed and faltered, my repentance and my worship is at its highest. You know, is that you today? On the other side of a fail can be equally beauty and authenticity, which can only be born out of understanding our desperate need for love, grace, and help. I truly believe that through our struggles and failures, if we allow ourselves to repent and receive the grace of God, we can learn so much. Tell me not, Curtis. Haven't you learned so much through your brokenness? Our failures or weaknesses do not disqualify us. They prepare us. So much of life is learning and understanding our shortcomings. We learn from failure, we apologize for wrongdoings, and we, we respond with gentleness and respect. There is a special grace that I truly believe in this mercy and love that flows from those who know that they have been forgiven of much. Get around somebody who knows they're forgiven. There's so much mercy, so much grace, and so much love that fills the air. So when I do wrong, I know who I go to. Someone who knows that they've been broken just like me. I can't stand getting around people that act like they ain't got not one thing going on with them. Not one weakness, not one. If the Apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of our New Testament, could get real, why can't we as the church? And we wonder why people run from the church, because they don't have a safe place. We can't say that we accept all people and then not love them when they come with their brokenness. Jesus tells us something in Luke chapter 7 as I think of that. He says... Hey, yo, Simon, let me holler at you real quick. That's how I'm going to say it, <laughs> you, right? He says, and Simon says, all right, teacher, go ahead. And Jesus told him a story. A man loaned two people. A man loaned money to two people, 5,000 to one and 500 to the other. 
but neither of them could pay him back. So he kindly forgave them both, letting them keep the money. Which do you suppose loved him most after that? I suppose the one who owed him the most, Simon answered. Correct, Jesus agreed. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon. I always thought that was interesting. He turned to the woman, but he's talking to Simon. You know what I mean? Look, this woman here kneeling here, when I entered your home, you didn't bother to offer me water or wash the dust off my feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You refused the customary kiss of greeting, but she has kissed my feet again and again from the time I first came in. You neglected the usual courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she covered my feet with rare perfume. Therefore, her sins, and they are many, <laughs> that's me, are forgiven. For she loved me much, but one who is forgiven little shows little love. That's what proves in scripture. Man, get around people who've been forgiven. When you're broken, it's hard to talk to somebody who acts like they haven't been forgiven of much. When we look at the situation with the money that was owed in the story, we can look at people and consider, well, they haven't did as much as me. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm the one who owes the $5,000, not the $500. i have been there. That's, that's how I see myself. How can I be for, forgiven? I'm the type of person where the church, if I went to the church, how many of y'all heard this comment? If I went to the church, the whole church would burn down. I've heard that from so many people, and I'm tired of the, the brokenness in their theology of what um, the, 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 the love of God looks like. Like, that's exactly where you need to be, homeboy. God loves you. True. I'm the type of person, you know, like I said, if I walked through the doors, I, it, would, it would burn down. This is where the gospel explodes all our moral categories. Let me tell you, accepting the gift of Jesus Christ requires humility because you are admitting that you can't save yourself by your own means. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you this, you aren't good enough on your best day to earn God's grace, and you aren't bad enough on your worst day to lose it. Jesus never accepted you because you were great. His acceptance of you is only because he is great. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes in Christian circles, we can get these standards if you know, we feel we've arrived due to our earnings and effort. Let me tell you one thing. There's no arrival without Jesus. He said, I am the truth and I am the way and I am the life. There's no arrival without Jesus. So whatever you're doing to earn the arrival and say, I finally made it, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Only Jesus is the way to heaven and to your relationship with God. See, when we consider the holiness and standard of God, it's too high to reach. I'm just letting you know it's too high to reach. Scripture says, all have fallen short of the glory of God, and the glory of God being the standard of his perfection. So if God is perfect, let me say it like this. Let's say that the moon, let's say that perfect is the moon, okay? Brainstorm with me. And let's say we are trying to jump to the moon. Let me tell you, I'm 230 right now, which is terrible. But if I jump to the moon, and then I have Curtis over here, who's athletic and sh in shape with a six-pack, if he jumped, I'm telling you right now, he could jump higher than I can. But according to the standard of the moon, my dude, right? It's funny, right? According to the standard of the moon, it doesn't matter, of, of perfection. True. We're so far off that nothing that you could do could get you any closer than through Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, it's impossible to have bragging rights with God. It's foolish to rest in anything outside of your faith in Jesus as your resting place. And scripture states in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For it is by free grace, God's un unmerited favor, that you ha are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation Amen. through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, of your own doing, and, and it came not through your own striving, the Bible says, but it is the gift of God. God, not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do. So no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. Receiving the embrace, receiving the hug, receiving the gift is fully dependent on the finished work of Jesus Christ. We look at the ugliness that he became while we rest in the beautifulness of that which he is. 
right? Second Corinthians 5.21 tells us that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him, not in your efforts, not in what you accomplished, not in all your pedigree. If you ever wondered what you're worth, turn down the opinions of others and consider that the Son of God didn't blink. He didn't think twice when he gave us his greatest gift of Jesus Christ. For our relationship with God comes through Jesus Christ, and he did for us what we can't do for ourselves. And let me tell you, no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, no matter what's been done to you, you can turn to Jesus and say, I need you, and the God of all grace stands ready to embrace you and receive you. See, can you fully receive his embrace today? I'm being completely honest. It's gifting season. It's the gifts season, right? We're going to celebrate Jesus this month. Uh, we reflect back on him, and, and I wonder how many of us are truly resting in the gift that he is to us. Are you trying to earn, deserve, or make your way to heaven like I was? And I totally robbed Jesus of his finished work when I did that. And I think so many of us miss salvation because we think it's in our own striving, earning, and deserving. Like my friend said, he's, I wonder one day if I'm going to make it into heaven. And through this process of my own self thinking this, I turn to 1 John 5.13. The Bible says, um, why am I having a, um, I'm so sorry. For the, 1 John 5.13, um, for it is written, right? Oh my goodness, why am I having a, yeah, 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 yeah. Why am I having that right now? Anyhow, oh, I got to turn there right now. Let me, let me turn there. I'm sorry, guys. 513, 513. Here we go. Oh, and this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Not hope, not I wonder, that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen? Amen. So my prayer for you and me when we receive and rest in the gift after, after the conversation um, that I had with my friend and I broke it down to him, he said, he went downstairs because he's staying with me, and he said this. He, he texted me this, Curtis. It's not in the do, it's in what has been done. And I said, man, that's my message. As I was preparing this message, that was what happened at my home. And that's my prayer in this Christmas season, that we would truly receive the embrace of Christ and trust in our salvation in him alone. Can I get an amen? So I want to ask you this, this morning. Have you rested in fully and only what Christ has done for you? And if you haven't, I want to ask you, would you hit the reset button and build your foundation of your spirituality and your relationship with Christ on that foundation? Because like myself, my, my, my Christianity, my walk with Jesus has been a broken one because I, was, I, I looked at the good news, the gospel, in a different light. What I was looking at was average news. How can we call that good news if I got to earn everything to get to heaven? I'm not good enough. I'm terrible. And I was just into broken news. I was into average news. But let me ask you, are you ready to receive the good news today? I want to ask you, if that's you today, I want you to type Jesus in the comments. If you're ready to truly rest in the embrace of God, whether you said you've been a Christian for 45 years, but you've been resting in something different, or today's the first time you heard this white boy preach something like this, and I told you about the good news of Jesus Christ, if you want to say, I want that full hug of Jesus. I want to rest in what he has done for me. Not in my own righteousness, but what he, what he has done for me. I want you to type the words Jesus right now. Go ahead and type Jesus right now. And I want to pray with you. Thank you for listening to me. Father God, I, why don't you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ alone. I thank you for him becoming my sin so that I can rest in you and have a relationship with God Almighty. Father, I repent of thinking that I could do this on my own and that we have to earn and strive and deserve your embrace. And Father, we hit the reset button now and we rest in the gift of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We give our lives to you right now and we ask that you move in and let us rest in your embrace. Father, we're saved and we're sealed 
through the finished work of the cross. And I am righteous today because of Jesus and Jesus alone. Father, I pray for everybody who's listening to me that they'll rest in the gift of Jesus and that they will have a relationship with God like no other. Father, I thank you for the spirit. I thank you for the spirit of God that dwells in us. Let us carry that. And Father, I thank you for today and for everything that you did. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys so much, and I'll talk to you later.